Our second speaker of the morning, uh, Dr. Shamila Khan, is an associate professor at uh, Boston Medical School. She uh, <coughs> specializes in uh, Islam, multicultural dynamics, and post-colonial theory with a clinical specialization in trauma, disaster relief, work in international and uh, refugee settings. She's um, director of a psychological internship program here at um, the medical school and has uh, worked in a lot of crisis, high trauma disaster settings, both in the US, working after the uh, Boston Marathon bombings, working in various international settings, most recently in Bangladesh. She's been involved in the Islamic Society of North America, the Pakistani Psychological Association, and the Committee for American Muslim Health Professionals. Uh, she has uh, worked with us at Danielson before, spoke at one of our other recent conferences, brings uh, a high level of awareness of the intersections between culture, religion, and mental health. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Khan. So I'm thankful to, um, to Stephen, George, uh, and Brad for giving me the opportunity to be with all of you here um, in this space, this eco ecological space. Uh, um, I'm also very thankful to the presenters who have given us a multitude of ways of thinking about this. And I know that as um, myself, I was just um, stretching my thinking in lots of different ways, and I was very appreciative of the uh, fact that I was able to do that here. Um, and um, I'm hoping that my talk will allow you to do the same to some extent. Um, so I am going to be taking somewhat of a risk and sharing a lot of personal aspects of my own identity with you. Um, part of that makes me vulnerable, but I feel like it's okay to be that in this setting. <laughs> So I'll begin uh, by locating myself in regards to the spiritual and religious traditions as embedded within my cultural experiences globally that inform my theoretical frameworks and my overall clinical approach. My global journeys have certainly influenced my clinical frameworks, and if I am to speak of my psychotherapy work with my patients, I am to first speak of who I am as an agent of change in the clinical settings. If I am to speak of integrating spirituality in my psychotherapy work, I need to be aware of that aspect of my own identity. So speaking of my identity, it's multi-layered, it's hybrid, it's contextual, it's shifting, it's just complex. Being a woman in this world is complicated. Being a person of color is complicated. Being Pakistani is complicated. And being a young professional is complicated. And you can rest assured that being a Muslim in today's world is complicated. Now, how do all the marginalized aspects of my identity intersect and how this shift as a transition between different regions in the world is further complicated? In order for me to work with people who enter the therapy room with their own complicated lives, I better have my own compl complicated matters somewhat sorted out or in the least be aware of them. As such, I'll begin by presenting a bit of my personal background as well as some personal beliefs and values that naturally impact my work. I was born in Pakistan, and then my family immigrated to Libya when I was two, followed by a move back to Pakistan at 13 for a couple of years, and then the final move to the US. And within the US, I shifted between upstate New York to New York City to Massachusetts. Throughout most of my life, these migrations have been the most significant events Immigrating at a young age, getting accustomed to varying ways of life, new cultures, new food, new ways of dressing, learning new languages were formative experiences. These transitions, with several beginnings and endings, raise questions in my mind about my identity and help trigger critical reflection. These transitions not just entail learning about the new culture, but learning about myself within the new locations, about fitting in and belonging. They altered my definition of the self, constructed and reconstructed how I understood and experienced myself to be. This developing curiosity about self and identity, about transitions and changes in people and how they develop, adapt, 
and come to be based on their histories naturally led me to be interested in multicultural psychology. Inclusive within the multicultural psychology, arraying aspects of one's identity that are intersecting. We heard a lot about intersectionality yesterday. And it's only in retrospect that I learned of these as I transitioned between three continents and learned to converse in seven different languages. Being a Muslim in Pakistan versus being a Muslim in Libya versus being a Muslim in New York pre and post 9-11 and now being a Muslim in Massachusetts are all very different experiences. They were very different experiences as they intersected with my ethnic identity amongst many others. This notion of intersectionality within the multicultural framework well captures the complexity of identity. As such, I want to ensure that when I speak to religious spiritual aspect of my identity, it's understood that it's always intersecting with multiple others, and as such, the experiences are subjective. Though now more multicultural than before, our Western paradigms are still often neglectful about inclusivity of the international global experiences with, which address the oppressive, subjugated, and ma marginalized aspects of identity as embedded in the sociopolitical histories and ideologies. Additionally, I've learned that identities are also shaped by colonial and transgenerational histories, and have expanded my psychodynamic framework, which is primarily, primarily object relational, to include the multicultural, post-colonial, and transgenerational frameworks. The integration of spiritual and religious aspects of my identity are, are embedded within the multitude of frameworks for me, and I'm guided by the works of relation theorists, including Jax Lacan, Carl Jung, Michael Foucault, Jax Derrida, Eric Fromm, Louis Althusser, Gayatri Spivak, Franz Fanon, Kimberly Crenshaw, Edward Said, and Homi Baba. To speak more specifically to the spiritual religious aspect of my identity as a Muslim, I was born into a Muslim family, studied courses about um, Islam in school. they are very different courses in Pakistan versus those that I took in Libya. And learned about its perspective about human nature from my mother, who was a practicing Sunni Muslim, and a father who was sometimes practicing and mostly non-practicing practicing Muslim. Um, my mom, who would pray five times a day for the most part, would always be encouraging my dad to come and do his prayers, and he would he would say, meaning, um, come on, let it be. This is between me and my God. Uh, stop meddling in it. Uh, so for me, I think transitioning between these different spaces, um, geographically, but also within the family, and having multiple perspectives sort of allowed me to entertain different ways of being. Uh, for my own self. Um, I've often been in places that are in between and not belonging to one or the other, and the outsider space is more comfortable than that of an insider. Um, that also applies to my theoretical ways of thinking. Um, so I went from being an agnostic uh, to a monotheist, to a practicing Muslim, to a somewhat practicing Sufi Muslim, or engaged currently in the Sabbath, about which is about introspection, transcends religion and is, is apolitical. My beliefs as a Muslim have evolved, ironically, just as America's attitude toward Muslims has devolved. The reality of being a Muslim American today is the same reality that people of color, immigrants, the LGBT community, women, Jews, and others have faced for centuries in this country. Composed over time by personal history, each of us brings our own deep-seated assumptions about life to psychotherapy. I recognize I have mine, and some I'm conscious of, and others that I may be unconscious of. The strategy is that of being aware and, and, and attempting not to impose our personal views on our patients. As stated earlier, my beliefs and views as a Muslim have evolved over time, and they're varying in a multitude of ways in which Muslim identity and belief system can present itself in a patient within our therapy room. And I've seen quite a lot of varying formulations. There are 72 sects within Islam, let alone how these aspects of identity gets intertwined with their cultural beliefs and intersect with other aspects of the identity. The key is that of openness, receptivity, sensitivity, being non-judgmental, curious, and having a check on your own existent and emerging biases. And that is no easy task. Some of the pertinent notions of Islam that I've learned about human nature, interestingly, map on neatly to the psychodynamic notions. Before I get to those, let me briefly lay out some of the generics. 
although I feel like I don't necessarily need to do that here. Islam is the second uh, largest religion of more than 1.8 million Muslims. Quran and Hadith are the true primary sources of Islamic scriptures. Quran is a holy book and Hadith is the narrations of the traditions of Prophet Muhammad. Now, Islamic Sufism mysticism emphasizes introspection and is actually a broader style of worship that transcends sex, directing followers inward, attention inward. Sufi practices follow under the renunciation of um, worldly things, purification of the soul, and the mystical contemplation of Allah's nature. In modern times, the predominant view of Sufi Islam is that of love, peace, and tolerance. Cognition is divided into two aspects, zahir and ghaib. Zahir, as explained, is the external or conscious, and ghaib, the internal or unconscious. Believing in the presence of ghaib is one of the principles of Islam, as per Quran. Ghaib in Islam is everything outside human consciousness. We see a similarity between Islam and Freud's understanding of cognition. There are three central ideas in Sufi Islam, which, are, which have shaped a lot of my work, um, and they're the nafs, the qalb, and the ruh. Uh, the origin and basis of these terms, in Quran, uh, terms is Quranic, and they have been expounded upon by centuries of Sufi commentaries. The late Dr. Israr Ahmed, who passed away in 2010, was a great advocate of understanding the Quran in light of the knowledge and embodied in our modern sciences. In fact, most of his work was based on interpreting the Quran in the contemporary idiom. Freud's theory is very much in line with Islamic concepts of nafs, qalb, and ruh in Sufi Islam and map onto the notions of the id, ego, and the superego. Um, speaking of the id, or the nafs, um, it's about ba emotions, basic instincts operating on seeking pleasure. It's unconscious. Nafs, nafs al-amr, there are different kinds of nafs, is a source of harmful inclinations according to the Holy Quran. It is a primal instinct that just like the id is hedonistic, is seeking, it seeks pleasure and avoids pain. Dr. Faridi says, if human beings allow the nafs to reign supreme, they will show no better behavior than that of their mammalian counterparts. The societal vices and etiquettes, as we understand, will cease to exist. It is this element of nafs within the human psyche that Islam seeks to control. In fact, contrary to the popular belief, the highest struggle, jihad, in Islam is a struggle against one's nafs, jihad bin nafs. It is unfortunately the lack of this self-impeachment mechanism that leads undisciplined men picking up arms and committing atrocities. Moving on from the nafs, AKA Ed onto the ruh, which is akin to the superego, inciting towards the right is a state of super consciousness. It is the moral component of the psyche, which takes into account no special circumstances in which the morally right thing may not be the right may not be right for a given situation. So it's enough, and then the ruh, and then this kalb, which is akin to the ego, which is reality-based conscious. The kalb, according to Dr. Israr, is a perpetual state of change. At times, it is. It is pulled by the nafs on one side and the ru on the other. The struggle to tilt the kalb of a person towards the ru should be the aim of every Muslim, which will lead to the state of nafs mutamina, or the reassuring soul. So these concepts are things that I've learned prior to having gotten into graduate training or learning about Freud and his ways of thinking. Um, and I found them very beneficial in my work with some of the Muslim patients. This language is something that's familiar and they can relate to that. Um, and I can have my internal conversation about the ego, superego, which, uh, you know, it all mixes up in a way that is complex, but makes sense to me. Although the Freudian concepts of id, ego, and superego have been compared with the Quranic concepts related to the nafs, the conflict between Freud's belief in inherent evil nature of human beings and the Islamic belief of the primordial goodness of humans has often been ignored. In regards to the Islamic frame, framework, I'm primarily influenced by the works of Shahidullah Faridi, Ibn Sina, Israr Ahmed, and Al-Ghazali, and by having a murshid and being a murid. Having a murshid is having a guide uh, in Sufi Islam, and you can have discussions with your guide, and you become a murid, and you learn from them. The questions at that time when I entered Sufi Islam that I was toying with then were, what is the role of Islam today in both theological and social terms? What is political Islam? Where did that come from? Why has the war on terror been reduced to the war on Islam? What is clergy's Islam? Why is clergy's Islam so different from a Sufi Islam? 
Are politics and Islam separable? I think I'm still toying with them. <laughs> Uh, so my knowledge in regards to Islamic Sufism existed prior to the start of my graduate studies, and I learned that conversations about the religious spiritual dimension in training were missing, and particularly so in the psychodynamic, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, where Freud regarded it as an illusion based on the infantile need for a powerful father figure, as we also heard yesterday. I learned that through psychother though psychotherapy has grown out of the context of a Western monotheistic perspective, Spirituality has been neglected by psychologists for many years, and the therapists are often unprepared to deal with this dimension in work. As I learned about dreams and unconscious wishes, I questioned the possibility of additionally being able to entertain other frameworks. So I remember uh, being in classes and learning about dreams and unconscious wishes, how they're related, and thinking, what? Where I come from, I've often seen my mother have this book, and when you have a dream, she would ask you about it, and there are symbols within the dream that she would have the book that's a religious book, and those symbolic symbols have meanings. And why could it not be about that? And bringing that, that into class, and there was no room for entertaining that way of thinking uh, and struggling with that. I remember writing a paper, analyzing it from the aspect of unconscious wishes, but adding this other framework and always wanting to sort of question, um, question these sort of ideas. Um, I often had to figure out how to incorporate in my role of psychology is my faith. Uh, I learned that you come closest to your relationship with the divine through the relation of compassion with other beings. Um, and that was important to me and is important to me. So working with patients generically, there's no typical course of spirituality integrated psychotherapy as I understand it, or a particular Islamic psychotherapy as spirituality expresses itself in numerous and varying ways. Spirituality is part of the process for me sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly, and such is also the case for the patients. And if not given room by the, by the clinician, this implicit notion plays out nonetheless. An important factor is ignored when the clinician fails to incorporate spirituality into the treatment of a spiritual individual. Studies clearly demonstrate that religiously oriented therapies have a positive impact in the treatment of religiously observant patients when treatment goals are framed within their spiritual context. People often make decisions based on their religion and may even adhere to certain rules of living founded upon their religious beliefs. So in my individual work, I'll just share some of the ways of thinking or the ideas that have come forth. Um, the notion of forgiveness has come up often. Uh, we talked about that yesterday as well. I've, we've ha I've had uh, people working with me who talked about uh, praying for forgiveness about things that they've committed that they thought were sinful and also praying for the person who wronged them to be forgiven. Uh, that's been part of the work. In sessions, me and my patients have had conversations with Allah um, as part of a dua. They've made references to the Prophet and his ways of operating in the world, which are the sunnah. We've talked about different sunnahs. We've talked about the notion of jinn. Um, we've talked about black eye, the nazar. Uh, for, some sacred, uh, for some sacred, it extends beyond the theistic God. Encounters of the past loved ones, angels. That's also uh, part of the conversations that I've had. We have used Quranic metaphors in sessions, and comments of, of this kind have emerged. It was the will of Allah. This was his choice, so I have to rely on it and recognize that there's something more to it that I cannot see and have yet to experience. Another person says, could Allah be a she? I asked my mother, and she was furious, but I thought you would be able to entertain the idea. You are the kind of mother I need. Now, that has multiple layers. <laughs> um, another one. Our session time was during the fast breaking. It's Ramadan. So I thought I would bring food along for us. Assuming you fast, do you? Somebody else saying, you know how it is for us Muslim women coming from someone who wears a hijab, and I couldn't really relate fully. Somebody who also came in for treatment um, thinking I was K-A-H-N Khan, and when they entered and recognized I was K-H-A-N Khan, it changed my whole religious identity. It said, I was looking for Khan, but I got Khan, shift in a religious identity, and we talked about that during set. Someone else saying, wow, holy cow, I didn't even know you were Muslim, so like, what now? I have a Muslim therapist. I wouldn't have been able to guess by looking at you, says a white male figure. Um, 
another one where we've talked about the satanic verses versus the Quranic verses. This is a person who had significant trauma history, and as part of uh, his history, um, there was times there were times when he was a victim, and other times when he was a perpetrator. So the part of him that related to being Satan-like, and we talked about the satanic verses of Rusty Salman, and we talked about the Quranic verses where he, he was the victim, and how we would shift between the Quranic verses and the satanic verses. It was just a playful metaphor that we used to understand him that I could also think of in many different other ways in the trauma framework, uh, and integrating the dissociated parts. My current work entails individual psychotherapy with the boundaries of of a clinical room, but additionally, a lot of outside the room work in disaster settings and refugee settings, both locally and internationally. It also entail entails collaborations with the spiritual and religious organizations. I do a lot of work here with Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center. I currently conduct therapy in four languages, and I work with significant number of immigrants, immigrants that bring with them diverse spiritual and religious traditions, both Muslim and others. I attempt to approach issues related to spirituality in an open, non-judgmental, accepting, and empathic manner. I attempt, I'm not always that. By adopting an approach where their worldviews are invited, inclusive of spirituality and religion, it allows me to explore its meaning for them. Sometimes my Muslim clients have searched for Muslim psychologists because they think their lived personal and religious spiritual experiences may not be interested by therapists who are not Muslim. Sometimes that is this case, other times it isn't. They imagine or assume we are like in our thinking. They wonder about or question my take on religion. They don't want a therapist. Some there are others who don't want a therapist for the religious spiritual orientation. And when they learn, it's a question as to what that means. Others who have had a reaction to having a Muslim therapist and associated assumptions. So overall, I'm assessing an individual. It is when I'm assessing an individual it's from a multi-layered form. It's intrapsychic. What objects have they internalized? And um, what, in, in addition to intrapsychic aspects, what is the interpersonal realm? How are they relating to their family, parental figures, but also beyond that, to the sociological, political realm? How are we shaped by so ideological beliefs and politics that we encounter? How are we, how are we shaped by the post-colonial ways of thinking? Having lived in a country that was colonized by the British, and seeing how the notion of colorism is so prevalent with people who come from those places um, being light or dark. Um, so those frameworks, how those shape us. And then intergenerational experiences that you may not have experienced directly but have been passed on through generations. So I look at people from these multiple angles and it's complex. Um, and don't, I don't always have all parts figured out, but I'm curious about them. Given this framework, next I'll present to you present you with some case snippets that capture the essence of this integration in practice. Um, to begin with, I conduct therapy in office and in the field. A great deal of my work since 9-11 has been in the domain of disaster relief and refugee work. My interest in this field began after 9-11, where I worked with the Muslim population from varying cultures and masjids in the, and in the therapy room, individually and in groups. Since then, I've conducted disaster relief work in Pakistan following the floods and earthquake as part of the Harvard South Asia Society. I've conducted work in Haiti in the aftermath of the earthquake. I've worked with the Japanese after the tsunami and in the school Pakistan, in Pakistan after the shootings of the 160 children in Peshawar, in Boston after the Boston Marathon bombings, and in Bangladesh with the Rohingya refugees, amongst numerous other local disasters and crisis management situations. From what I've seen, the impact of disasters can be far-reaching from individuals and families to entire communities and nation, and crisis situations often call into question one's basic beliefs. Disasters over the last decade have brought a considerable amount of attention to the role of clergy and congregations following disasters. Research has already demonstrated that a significant percentage of disasters survivors turn to faith, faith leaders, and faith communities in times of disasters. I've collaborated with faith community-based leaders on multiple occasions in disaster settings. I've seen that suffering may cause religious believers to believe more strongly in God than they did before because our minds are designed to seek explanations for phenomena we see around us that we cannot fully explain. What I've also found interesting is how religious believers and non-believers quickly reach diametrically opposing conclusions about the implications of the disaster. For non-believers, natural disasters are evidence that God does, ex does not exist. For what kind of benevolent, just or omnipotent figure would ca cause harm to so many innocent people? Invariably, however, believers usually experience a strengthening in their faith after a disaster. There may be 
A time of questioning and some believers may see their faith shaken deeply, but for most, tragedy brings greater commitment to religious faith, not less. People draw on spiritual methods of coping designed to assist in understanding and dealing with potentially threatening and damaging situations. Spiritual methods of coping are quite varied from what I've witnessed. Let me share some with you. Um, so uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, um, I went there and I spent some time in Port-au-Prince um, where I worked with some of the survivors and then shifted to working in Miraguan, um, which is a location within Haiti uh, that's composed of the Muslim population. Um, when a, so Haiti is a strongly Catholic country. Christian motifs are everywhere in Port-au-Prince. Mercy Jesus, soft chance of accept Jesus. And then uh, when I went to the Miraguan region, there was a place where Shif, uh, there's a Mufti, Shaheed Muhammad. Uh, he's established a Darul Uloom in the Miraguan region, which cares for Muslims of the entire country. The Muslim population within Haiti is 1%. Um, and the Sunni Muslims and the Ahmadi Muslims, which where I come from, could not even live together, are there together as one. Um, and here, I went here and I would hear the Salah and uh, the prayers and Allah. And when I would go back to Port-au-Prince, it was mercy Jesus and accept Jesus. But what was interesting is that both of these um, faith believers additionally believed in voodoo. Somebody said to me, yeah, I may be Muslim and they may be this, but everybody's 100% voodoo. Um, it's, it's widely acknowledged, but practice only behind closed doors with practice Krishna is often placing candles and icons on the floor of a home and dancing to music and drums. Following, followers believe the world is under the power of loas, spirits and deities, who act as intermediaries between human and God. In voodoo, disasters like the earthquake are not the result of natural forces, but displeasure by a loa. Voodoo is a mixture of Catholicism and traditional African beliefs. There is at the core the notion that everything you know, people, trees, rocks, everything has spirit and a spiritual reality. Uh, to it, and it's just as real and as accessible as a physical reality. So from framework of trauma, individual subjective, and uh, struggle diagnosis had to be taken into account, um, their religious and cultural values. Um, so I remember being there and just working with some of the Muslims, and it would be in a space that the Mufti had created. We would see these individuals work with them, and then we would all pray together. It was namaz time, and I would be right there with them doing the prayers. Um, and then some of them would be able to talk about some of the additional, uh, if you made space and asked about the lowest, they would share that, but not bring it in on their own. Um, I remember people coming in, and I remember a gentleman coming in, and his whole leg that was damaged like was wrapped in uh, leaves, and he talked about how the leaves were healing him, and the power and all of that. And how do you so learning to incorporate all these different ways of thinking that were beyond what I had known uh, is fascinating. I just I feel like, and we have to be receptive and include that and understand it, and not just understand it from how we make sense of it, but how they make sense of it. Um, and it was also interesting. Um, how people dressed up to come meet with you. What it meant for them to be seen by somebody from the outside world. And that brings into this idea of like what the outsider means. Uh, um, people literally dress up to just be seen. What it meant for them to take something along, physical. Um, I remember giving multivitamins after meeting with them because Verbal language and talk therapy was not all. They needed to have something physical. So you just, you know, all the physicians were giving medications. I would give them multivitamin. That's part of the work, yeah? Um, and then I came back and worked uh, with the Haitian population here and what that was like. Um, and people would not bring in these other aspects. So how are these people different than the ones who didn't make it across? And what their understanding was about what you don't bring to the therapy room? Um, what you leave behind. Uh, it was also interesting to see that there were Haitians who spoke French and those who spoke Creole. And there was a class issue associated with that, and that nobody talks. So the intersectional aspect of it is highlighted again. Uh, let me shift to a different setting. Uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, 
from the moment it occurred for me to step in, like the day it happened, uh, I'm a first responder, uh, enlisted as one, so it happened and it was right by BMC where I work and I was called in and uh, part of the work was setting up a family assistance center so all the um, people who were impacted, survivors who were coming in, uh, we were receiving them and sending them where they needed to go but also the family members receiving them, working with them and helping them prepare, get prepared for what they may encounter in terms of their loved ones and part of the work was me driving between different hospitals uh, if somebody came in and their loved one was not at this hospital, I had the um, privilege of being able to drive them to the different, because everything was on a lockdown, but we, had, we were able to drive in between space. And I remember driving one of the families, um, and this was a couple, um, and as we, we were driving, on the, uh, the phone rang, and they heard the news that their child's uh, leg was probably going to need to be amputated. Um, and I remember stopping the car and uh, the mother is overwhelmed and really crying and like I'm holding her hand, what we consider I'm providing psychological first aid in that moment. So she's holding her my hand and just really venting, like how could this happen? And my, it's my, I cannot believe that, you know, all this is going, she's saying all this and then she goes, I can't believe this is happening. How could they do this to us? They need to get out of this country, these Muslims. The irony of the moment, the hand that she was holding was that of a Muslim woman as well, unbeknownst to her. Uh, I stopped, paused, I remember like my grip loosening and then tightening it back up, like no, what is my role? My role is to just kind of alleviate her stress, this is not about me. Um, I did not tell her I was Muslim. It was important not to do that. Uh, and those are the kinds of moments that happen in clinical settings as well, where we may be driven and you know, compelled unconsciously to say something, or, but like recognizing what are we saying for what reason, and what are we doing what. I did not end up sharing that with her. Uh, this event ended and carried on, and I came home at night and just looking at my hand and just tears coming through and just feeling like, how do I make sense of this? Um, so, and as I ended up sharing some of this at the Islamic Center the next day, somehow it got captured and it got written up in the Globe. Uh, the family read that um, and contacted me. And the conversation that we had thereafter was so beautiful. And so it's like, it just, she was so appreciative of me not having said that. And I explained why I wouldn't say that, but what it felt like as, as well. And that was a learning moment for both of us. I think there's beauty in that. Um, I also was part of the Zernayev trial, um, and I would, I was supporter, uh, supporting the victims, and when they were making the um, victim impact statement uh, at the courthouse, we'd go there every day and listen to what he had to say, and people testifying, the victims telling their stories, and just feeling like the only Muslim in this room is that, the him and me. And what does that mean? Like, what space am I in? Looking inwards, and uh, I remember at one point um, they were showing images of him with the background where uh, all these scriptures were written in kalma um, and whatnot, and uh, name of Allah. And uh, somebody uh, within the courtroom—I uh, don't know if he was a survivor or not—but noticed. Uh, me wearing this pendant, which I am always wearing. It says Allah on one side and has the quills on the other side. Saying, oh, that you're wearing is very similar to what they were showing. That has multiple meanings. And me thinking in that moment, do I say something? And I just said, yes, it is. And nothing more. There was a discomfort in that silence of me not explaining. I did not need to explain. I thought to myself, I am not the one on trial here, and neither is my religion, and I don't feel the need to defend or explain. Um, so I went on. Uh, but their encounters as such that you have, so I'm explaining it from my angle, as a personal angle as well, because these are the kind of people that may end up in the therapy room and what, kind of, what it means to have had those experiences and how to entertain that. Um, at the same time, I was, we had gotten this grant to conduct the resiliency center for the survivors, and at the same time, the shooting had taken place in Pakistan, where the 160 children were killed in Bishawar. And I was asked to come there, and I took some time here to go there. 
I just remember toying with the idea that we have a five, a three million dollars to conduct this resiliency center, and I went there and there was just nothing. And what am I doing? Where? What am I providing? Where? <laughs> and just toying with that, and then recognize every life is just as important. But I have to work through my own process of what this means um, and the importance of that. Um, I'll shift now to the work with the Rohingya refugees. This persecution there is based on religion. It's the world's largest stateless ethnic group. Uh, the plight of hundreds of Rohing thousands of Rohingyans, you, people is said to be the world's largest growing refugee crisis, uh, risking death by sea on or on foot. About 700,000 have fled the destruction of their homes and persecution in Rakhine province in Myanmar, Burma, for neighboring Bangladesh since 2017. The UN describes a military offensive in Rakhine which provoked exodus as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Obviously, the scale of camp, ha of camp was unlike anything I've ever seen. Just being in that space and what it felt like, it was intense, uh, let alone the work. Um, how much time do I have? <laughs> OK. OK. Um, so I'll skip some parts. Um, so there I went with a team um, of five men and uh, myself. I think just they're all Muslim. And I think just being a woman in the team was an interesting experience in itself. And how each one made sense of their faith and religion was interesting. Um, and I was the only uh, psychologist. Everybody else was a physician or a psychiatrist. Um, uh, so I just remember uh, <laughs> there's some challenging moments there. Uh, I met with a lot of people and just doing I was given uh, these assessments to conduct to uh, for, regarding their depression or anxiety or PTSD, and I just remember being getting really frustrated. How am I supposed to ask them like, how is your sleeping? They don't have anything to sleep on. What does your food like it take like? You know, like they have no food. Like, how am I supposed to do all of this? They're just throwing it out and just feeling really frustrated with these uh, assessment methods that are so Eurocentric, based on like have no regard, they have no understanding of the context um, and the reality there. But uh, just leaving it all aside and you know questions like, are you sad? Are you crying? And I'm thinking. They had such stories, and I can't begin to share some of those stories, but it just there was a way in which people would share those stories. And they were completely stoic. Um, there were no tears. There was no sadness. It is trauma of the kind that's beyond all of that. Um, I remember some of the stories that really stayed with me uh, of a woman who talked about how her whole house was burned, and she ran out. Her husband, uh, her mother-in-law was burned in there. And she ran out, and she saved her baby. Uh, and she was just so glad to have saved her baby and holding on tight to the baby. Um, and, um, and the Burmese coming and taking the baby and throwing the baby in the fire. Um, and then being raped thereafter. And what that like stories like that that were of extreme torture, the nature that you just, I couldn't respond listening to the story. I mean, there was a lot that was coming up. Um, but. There's a way to make sense of that it was different than the work that I had done. It, it, I had needed to expand my way of thinking, and I needed to have space for my own self to sort of process all of this. Um, and I remember just being in Bangladesh and doing all this. And at the evening, I would just go out. I would do all of these things. It was just I was skydiving. I went bungee jumping. I was like, what am I doing? I think there's a way in which I felt so helpless and so out of control, like not being able to do anything that I needed to do things that made me feel like I could be out of control, like you could do things. Um, and so I ended up conducting, uh, I met a lot of women um, who were coming in to get tests done for being uh, pregnant. And many of these women who were pregnant were pregnant due to being raped. Um, so I ended up starting a group uh, with the women who were raped and were pregnant. Uh, it started as a group of five women. Um, Initially, there was a resistance, and it felt like there was a team that had come before, and they felt like what was done, they didn't want to do. And what they had done was meditation. I mean, imagine yourself, you're going in a setting, meditation is your training, you incorporate it in your work, you go and conduct. So it was interesting, because meditation comes from faith of Buddhism. 
and Burmese who were inflicting all of this on them were Buddhists. How do they make sense of that? Not recognizing uh, some of that. So um, what I ended up doing was starting a group with them nonetheless, so they were open to the fact. Um, we <laughs> did some really interesting work. Um, it was, um, part of the work was just bearing witness to their story and the power of that. Um, it was unspeakable trauma, and they would initially talk about the trauma in a very stoic ma manner, and like over time we learned to just sort of capture some of that sense of the emotions. Um, some of the experiences are so profound that there are no words, um, and we endure in silence that the emotional price of remaining silent without a witness is costly. The ghosts that they worked hard to keep in the past were haunting them. Additional trauma there for some of them. I asked myself the question often at the heart of psychoanalysis of how could I help them turn their ghosts into ancestors? Although I was pained by their stories, many of them didn't seem to be. I was feeling what they couldn't feel. It changed. It won't let me discomfort. I, w I wasn't trying not to let my discomfort with their pain keep me from witnessing it for them. Uh, so a lot of the work was, in the beginning, um, there was, uh, we talked about, well, we don't have to do meditation in the context of how they have been made to do in the past, but maybe we could, you know, do tasbihat, which is the form of meditation in Islam. So you have these um, prayer beads that you meditate on. So I went into the market the next day and brought all these uh, tasbihs. And we came back and worked on these puspies together. So initial process was no conversation, but it's just you know doing your zikr or whatever you wanted to do on your tasbi, and making the rabata through made, through the prayer reads you make rabata rabata meaning connection with the God. People had different things that they had needed to say to God, um, and um, the, the initial one was auzabil. Like it's, it was about, I seek refuge in God. Um, and that was the first one that I remember that we did together. And we would just all do that and then talk about what that felt like and what that was the meaning for each one. Um, and each person told their story. And we decided that each time a different person would tell their story, but they would figure out what they, we needed to recite on the tasbih that time. So people gave, come in, came in with different um, ideas. I think one that I was really struck by was uh, many of them felt this, that they had lost so many loved ones and they never got to really go through the process of burial. Uh, that is so important. Um, and um, when somebody passes away, you do this prayer together and you gather and recite in Nalillahi wa Nalillahi Rajun. And so many of them were like, sort of touched by wanting to do that. So we made the decision that we were going to do that together uh, for the loved ones that they lost. So we did recite that on the tasbih together. And the power that was there, I remember that was the first time I saw tears in that room. And to be able to get to those tears, I was smiling. <laughs> uh, but there's, it just, there's, so mean, there's so much meaning to it that I couldn't, um, how do I explain some of that in the context of a uh, psychoanalysis. I don't know. There's a way in which I'm still toying with some of these because I've been questioned when I presented some of this work in the past about boundaries and the clinical boundaries. And like, in, like I was speaking to you yesterday, like a, the whole notion of boundaries itself is cultural. <laughs> and we need to extend and be able to extend those boundaries in ways that are fitting for the people that we work with. Of course, you have to keep in mind what you're doing and for what reason. <laughs> but we should be able to extend that and not hold on to them rigidly. So, um, time? OK. Uh, so since then, um, oh, where should I go with this? I think it's, <laughs> I've done a lot of work with Islamic Center, and I think maybe I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, conducted uh, uh, after the Boston Marathon bombings, I started a women's resiliency group. Um, and there are lots of women in the group who wear hijab. And when I enter that space, I'm also wearing one. And uh, we would talk about things together. And 
what they're going through. Some of them were talking about being um, targeted, but many of them also talked about positive experiences of being understood and people coming in and checking in with them if they were okay. Um, this is very different than the experience that I had after 9-11 when most people were just being targeted. There was some sort of development that had taken place and people were appreciative of those who were coming in as well. And um, I would conduct an open group also in addition to that uh, at the center where we would just gather and talk about what the day was like and people who were fearful, people who were hiding their um, legal sort of factors like their um, immigration status and whatnot, things that people are worried about, and we would come up with all sort of, sorts of forums that we would put up for them to be able to access information. Um, and also, at the same time, like, you know, conducting this group, and it's at a masjid, the Islamic center, and then you would conduct this group, and it was natural to just get up, and it's prayer time, go, do the namaz together, all of us, and then go and have a conversation and eat together. Uh, different than the boundaries of clinical setting. <laughs> but meaningful um, and important. Um, I also, over the time, over time, have Islamic Center uh, of Boston, it's called a cultural center as well, and they're very receptive to different ways of thinking. I've taken people from my program to just experience being there for students to learn like what it's like and the receptivity that's there, uh, contrary to assumptions that they may have. Um, I, interestingly enough, have been conducting an LGBTQ group uh, with the Muslim within that center. Uh, one wouldn't think that that could happen in that space, but it can. Uh, it's all about how you hold all those things together and allow uh, for them to be entertained. Um, so um, I think I'm just going to stop here uh, because I could go on and on with experiences, but uh, maybe leave room for conversation. Thank you. Questions for Dr. John? I guess I should stand here. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, my question is, how have you or how do you sustain your own um, centeredness, your own grounding, um, especially since you work so often in contexts where trauma is not, you know, one on one, but it's contextual, cultural? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, one, in therapy, but aside from that, I think it's helpful because I think to begin with, this whole notion of being centered and together, for me, is also a cultural one. Where I come from, you don't need to be centered and together at all times. It's okay to be outwardly emotional. It's okay to be in a different state. Um, I feel that um, I, I do have a sense of who I am, but it is shifting, um, and I think being between different spaces has allowed me to do that, um, because my own sense of self shifts so occasionally that this idea of like how am I centered is un somewhat unfamiliar. I have a general sense of that, but I think I'm a very different being when I'm speaking one language versus another. I'm closer to someone, I'm more distant from someone, I'm touching somebody or I'm not touching somebody whether I'm making eye contact or not. I'm a very different person when I'm wearing my hijab or I'm a very different person when I'm wearing shalwar kameez versus when I'm wearing pants. Or, like, there's so many different ways of being and I'm so used to being in so many different places and different contexts that shift my own sense of identity on a regular basis that this whole notion of centeredness is complex <laughs> for me to, um, so I don't I feel like I'm always holding dialectic spaces, um, um, and I can shift from one to another uh, pretty rapidly. Yet, nonetheless, there is some sense of centeredness. Um, and for me, that does come from prayer. It does come from my connection with God. Um, it comes from my conversations with my murshids, uh, to whom I'm the murid, who can understand and relate to that.
time out of breath taking. Can you share with us how you prepare yourself to be in some of these crisis yeah. settings? That's an important question. Um, I do have to prepare myself, and I learned that uh, over time. Uh, because I've been in situations where I would just keep extending myself, and it took a toll on me. Um, so I think boundaries in that sense are important. Um, I, you know, I'm also married to somebody who lives in a different country, so he goes in back and forth, and so all this notion of in-between spaces is uh, interesting. But I think having uh, some consistency in some of that um, wanting to be around loved ones before I'm leaving, being able to be in touch with them when I come back, um, but also knowing how much is too much, uh, where am I entering, what I may encounter, having some sense of that. Um, I remember after the Boston Marathon bombings, I was doing this all the way from when it happened till 10 p.m., and someone pulling me aside and saying, you need to stop. And it was so, I was so glad that they said that um, because I would have gone on. Um, but within that framework of disaster relief work, the um, operational structure is set as such that you rotate. You're not always the one who's doing all the work and there are time frames within which you go in and there's time for processing what you've gone through thereafter. So that's built in. But also doing things that I love doing afterwards. Like, everybody, nobody could understand why I wanted to go skydiving after doing all this. Like, what, what are you doing? You know, but for me, that was self-care. Like, I needed to do that for myself. So being able to be in touch with those parts, like, I need something else. Uh, if it doesn't make sense to anybody, that's OK. Uh, but I know it. Like, you know, so those sort of things. Um, and all other sorts of self-care practices, which have a lot to do with my own faith then. You know, being able to pray and talk and have conversations with God. Um, that helps. Um, that's about self-care as well. So there are a multitude of ways, um, but that took a lot of learning for me to get to that place uh, of preparing and being ready to do the work and also taking breaks. Like uh, my work with the Rohingya refugees, when I came back, they asked me to conduct grand rounds on it. This was a f two, three weeks of coming back. I said, no, I can't. I knew that I was such an emotional space. I would not be able to process or convey what I was, uh, what I had experienced. I needed to sit with it. <laughs> um, they asked me to come back uh, within three months to do some more work. They asked me to create di mental health guidelines for work with Rohingya refugees. I, I couldn't do that work. I said no. Um, not yet. I am going to do that. They asked me to come back in three months. I did not go back. I'm planning to go back in December again, but I needed that time away. <laughs> to be more ready to be able to do the work. Uh, because if I'm not in that space, what, of what use am I to those I'm working with? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, given your immersion in the atrocities that people uh, can do, you know, commit on one another, do you have a way of making sense of that for yourself spiritually? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it goes back to some of the notions that I was mentioning. Uh, the notion of nafs and what drives us in what direction. Um, and that those aspects and possibilities are there. You see it historically. Um, you see conversations about in that and the work of um, in the Sunnah of Muhammad. Um, you see that um, you know in people that you encounter on a daily basis. But I think having that framework uh, is helpful. Um, so I think you know just going back to that, this person is really struggling with their nafs, um, and how can that change? Like you know whether it's generally outside in the larger framework or individually with people that I'm working with. It's just, um, and I, I struggle with that myself. I could see how one can go to the other side. Uh, I've done a lot of writing for my own self, which I haven't shared about those who, um, who are committing these crimes and these acts of terror and what could take one to that side. It's not too unfamiliar. <laughs> we ha all have those parts within us can tilt to the other side. So what is it that can make one tilt? And the possibility of that existence, just knowing that is helpful in itself. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in the trauma literature, there's a, a growing emphasis on focusing on moral injury. On what? Moral injury, hmm. which is, in, I was thinking about it in terms of your presentation of the elements of, uh, key elements within Islam. I, those would be uh, huh. damage or blows to the super ego or the rue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, how often do you come across that in your disaster related work with uh, Muslims where the, the focus may not be so much on the nafs yeah. and yeah. more on the sense of guilt and shame and self uh, recrimination as irrational or inappropriate or sometimes appropriate it may be and how do you hand, what do you do with that? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not familiar with the trauma literature speaking to that so I would be interested um, but that does come up and people um, people are much more easily able to talk about the concept of nafs. But when it comes to the rue, it's much more in, intang intangible. Like, it's hard to get to that. Um, they have the sense of moral guides and the super ego and shame and guilt that comes with what they're doing. And that conversation is a much more difficult conversation. You know, the notion of shame to entertain that and have a conversation about that in general is a complicated one. Um, but relating that to your own sense of self and your identity, um, it does come up and comes up in multiple forms and multiple ways. They can be looking at it very concretely or very broadly. Um, and Ru um, has taken the form of Ru of people that they work with or those that are deceased. Ru has taken the form of the general sense of your own essence. Ru has taken the form of rue that's sent to you from God. Uh, so it comes in in multiple forms. Based on how it's subjectively experienced by each individual, I would entertain it with that format. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you, Dr. Khan. I'm wondering what the transitions are like for you and how you manage them between your disaster work and then coming back to be a clinician a clinical supervisor and an administrator. Yeah, um, I think it really. Thank you for that question. It really helps to be part <laughs> of a program. Uh, the part that I, um, the program that I'm part of that I direct is the Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology. It's helpful to be coming back to a place where the like-minded individuals who can understand these ways of thinking and being. I think having that network goes a long way. Um, I have a team of faculty members that I work with who are very aware of these ways of thinking and being able to have those conversations or share those experiences in a place that feels safe in that sense um, has been very meaningful. Um, and for that reason, I've limited my um, individual work to currently one day a week um, because I don't think I would be able to do more than that. Um, given all that I'm doing and how much I can bring to that, um, that room. Um, but some of these conversations um, are not easy to have. Um, what I'm sharing here today is not what I would be able to share in different contexts. Um, and, um, and the fact that I have a space where I can come back and have that safety net where I can have those conversations is very meaningful. Um, these are difficult conversations um, and sharing of those experiences, projections and interjections <laughs> uh, that are part of the work um, where your own biases can be shared without uh, worry uh, and be entertained and listened to and heard and received uh, is meaningful. Um, so that helps. Yeah. And I'm always in touch with my murid, uh, with, the, with the murshids as a murid when I'm going through some of this. Um, Murshid happens to be out of the country, but I can get in touch with them, thanks to WhatsApp. One of the questions I might have is, any challenges you've experienced when working with Muslim clients around psychotherapy itself, and maybe that's because it's a because it's often applied as a cultural psychotherapy, as if it's not cultural. Um, <laughs> but, but ways in which you've had to maybe adjust or think differently, I think that's maybe true of many religions and psychotherapy, 
But does that make sense what I'm asking? If you could just say a little bit more. Uh, well, so what are some of the challenges um, with patients, uh, um, on how Muslim patients, yeah, around how do I use psychotherapy? What is psychotherapy? Mm -hmm. You know, um, adjustments you've had to make or, or, or ways you might talk about it differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pros and cons yeah. or challenges and gross. Um, so it comes in varying ways. Uh, there are people who end up making it to the room are very different than those who don't make, make it to the room, right? Um, so a lot of that work that you're talking about happens before they make it to the room. So having collaborations with entities where they have that availability and focus has been part of the work. So I would talk about mental health um, and psychology at the Islamic Center. Um, I have spoken at different uh, conferences, the ICNA conference, uh, the ISNA conference, to be able to go to places and talk about it in a very real way and relate it to your own identity uh, of being a Muslim. So those people who may have thoughts and ideas about it are sort of cautious. They would be more willing to engage in a conversation or be more curious about it um, has been a lot of the work, and I think some people have come into therapy based on some of those conversations, uh, and their way of thinking about it and working with them is very different than somebody who just is coming in. Uh, the people who are coming in just because you're Muslim and you want, they want to work with you, so they have a notion of like, oh, this person is going to understand what I'm going through as a Muslim, and this idea of psychotherapy, they can bring up and they can even say, like, what is this like, and what are, what are we going to be doing? Um, but I think that outside work makes a big difference. So it depends on who is coming in with what sort of a mindset. There are others who are coming in who are very well aware of psychotherapy, have been in psychotherapy, and there are others who don't want to be in psychotherapy with me because you're Muslim and they're Muslim and they're like, nope, that's not what I want. Uh, so it could come in in numerous forms and ways of, yeah. But it does make me extend uh, and have to explain what this process is like. I've often explained it in terms of like, we go to a doctor and when we're ill and we have an injury, and why can't we do this? What, are, what is the thought uh, behind this? What, what gets in the way? What is that sigma that they have? What are they carrying within them? How have they made sense of meaning of it prior to coming in? Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. I, I find the work that you do truly extraordinary. Okay. And I was thinking of the image that I showed yesterday of, of Green Tara. Yeah. You are a, a bodhisattva warrior. Oh, please. <laughs> um, yeah. Please. Truly. Thank you. And as I was listening to you, I, I started to reflect on ambivalence around compassion, because probably everybody here is aware of feeling a lot of compassion for the people that you, you try to work with and support. But often, th there's this protective ambivalence around getting too close to suffering. Yeah. And I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about your own relationship to ambivalence, or if you don't feel it, what you're aware of that helps you um, not be burdened by that obstacle. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been asked this sort of question in multiple ways in the past, and how do, uh, I think the ambivalence is there. It has been there. It always is there. But I think there's a way in which I've learned to just be okay with it. And I think learning to be okay with it is based on experience. Because I think when you are growing up, but as just a kid, like just being in different places and having a lot of ambivalence about lots of shifts and lots of changes, um, and learning that it's okay, you can be this way, you can be it's okay. <laughs> like you know, there's a way in which I came to a place of like, I was my Murshid, what he says, you know, um, it's there's a reality out there and what's happening, and it's your sense of that reality. And you can see it one way or another way. Uh, you can make it complicated, or you can make it easy. So, what would be the way that would be complicated? What would the way that would be easy? It allows me to extend my thought from one end to the other, and then choosing one. Yet, I can still feel the other. But when I'm feeling the other, being able to have a conversation about that. 
So when people are coming in, they're so caught in a particular way of viewing something, right? And it's, the view is so narrow. Uh, so part of the work in ch working through that ambivalence is expanding that spectrum and those possibilities. If it could be this way, or it could be this way, this is where you are. Um, so I think I do that for my own self, but I also do it for the people that I'm working with, or giving, expanding that perspective in some form or another from their own way of thinking, whether it's in, based on their religion or faith or any other you know, cognitive capacity, that they, whatever it may be. Uh, so just getting that out of that tunnel vision, looking at this, but like we have thinkable, we have a world of thinkable ideas, but then there are things that are beyond those thinkable ideas, that it's even broader than that, um, because people can get into this very intellectualized, uh, rationalized con conversation with you about that. Um, so that there are things that we can't touch or see, but they exist and are beyond our knowledge. I think that expands it even further. Uh, but I think uh, for me, just having lived experiences that allowed me to do that or made me but have no choice but to do that initially. Um, and then having the Marsha that sort of helps me think through that and then being able to apply that for different people uh, from their own domain or framework. Yeah. I also would like to say thank you for such a beautiful talk. And I'd like to ask you if you feel like you have learned anything about how to bear witness in a way that really uh, is felt as witness. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, one can think of it simplistically in terms of you bearing witness, you're just listening to somebody's story. But I think you know, thinking of it in counter-transferential format, like what is, sometimes I was feeling for them um, in this way that they couldn't hold, but I wouldn't want to contain that feeling within me so I could discard that easily. But learning to sit with it for their sake, to be able to experience, so help them see me experience it and get it back, give it back to them in a reformulated way. Um, I don't know if that's I'm being clear, um, but it's one thing to just hear a story and sit with it and have a person see that you can sit with their story. But to sit with the story, allow yourself to not be that neutral person who has to contain it all, be able to express and say what you feel, uh, and then helping them sense that this, might, this is what they might be feeling as well and I couldn't stand, or like, why would they be feeling, and give it back to them. That's a different added, uh, I think there's a lot in our uh, psychoanalytic framework that talks about like this notion of neutrality and what you don't carry and what you don't share. And I think, you know, if you bring in those parts sometimes, it's, it makes it even a deeper experience for the other to even know what you're go doing and be able to explain it and give it back to them. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, powerful talk. Um, uh, when you enter into these different cultures, for example, what what is your way in, your primary way in? Is it because of your faith, your language, for these cultures that aren't necessarily therapy cultures or interested in therapy or, you know? Th yeah. Um, so it's been a variety of reasons. Um, Sometimes it is language. Uh, I think lots of people, uh, so there's a uh, department of mental health and department of public health have uh, disaster relief teams. I'm part of the disaster behavioral health committees. Um, so you list your area of expertise and um, having listed cultural factors and linguistic factors, so they call upon you. And over time, your work just, you know, people that are familiar with you calling you in for multiple reasons. Um, and sometimes, as you can see, very often I've gone back to Pakistan. It's because I'm from there. I know the language. Um, uh, but also recognizing that, you know, um, the way in is like making use part of it is just becoming aware in terms of the knowledge and gaining that knowledge. So if, when we were going into Haiti, recognizing what is the history of this country? What has happened here? Who are the people? Um, 
what has happened historically prior to that, what is a sociopolitical context, where the living, what is a culture like around there, um, and having people on the team who are from within that culture. Um, and then going in, I think those are the preparation that make, goes a long way. So part of it is how you are as a person, how you carry and with humility and wanting to know and understand. And um, so there's a lot of work that done globally that I'm not part of at PU, uh, partly because of that stance of us as being Eurocentric Western knowledge-based people who go in to give knowledge uh, to the world and uh, take care of them um, that I struggle with. So I think it's we who need to go in and gain the knowledge to be able to provide the help. Uh, so I think that stance, um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Khan. I loved your expression and your reaching out um, when you talked about the complicated or uncomplicated. When you talked about um, and showed the example of reaching out and touching and holding someone's hand, you know, so uncomplicated, but such an expression of compassion without a prayer. My husband would talk about it, God with skin on. Yeah. I, I just loved your, your example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I have a comment and I have a question for you, Dr. Khan. Yeah. So, uh, my father, you know, was a, a therapist and a counselor, and I find that stuff very difficult. I'm a general surgeon, and so when you were talking about the Boston, uh, marathon incident tragedy, I was thinking it would be very easy for me to take care of that child and remove his leg in order to save his life. I would rationalize that. But it would be very difficult for me to be with the family and do all the things that you did and other therapists in this room would be doing. So I appreciate all that you do in that regard. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Khan. Um, as you talk about witness, I also think about witness as an invitation to responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, how have you dealt with that moment of being there and being able to leave, and mm -hmm. then not being able to leave? Yeah. And how do you sit with that? How do they also sit with that with you? Yeah. That's a real struggle. Um, it really is. And it goes back to the whole idea of taking care of yourself and your boundaries and those, you know, the moments when I go in and I'm there for two weeks, three weeks, and then I'm gone. I have to prepare myself for that and I have to prepare them for it. Um, because this work is, you know, sort of temporary and not ongoing and I struggle with that. But I think they can carry me with them and I can carry them with me. And I think me being able to speak to that uh, and knowing that I'll encounter people here who may be coming from that framework uh, gives some consolation, but I have that sensitivity is there. Um, and this idea that I'm, I go in, I'm helping, and then I'm gonna be gone, and what does that mean? Um, but I think every encounter um, is meaningful in itself. It could be, those encounters could be ongoing for a long time, and it's meaningful, but it could be one time, and it could be meaningful. Um, that's something that each person gets out of it, um, just retaining that and holding on to that um, serves some consolation. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's more of an idea in my mind that it means that I'm not able to do more or that something was un left undone, but it could be the same for somebody that I was like, working with for a very long time. <laughs> Uh, that something could be left undone, uh, that I could have done more. Um, so in that sense, uh, a short encounter versus a long one becomes the same. Um, but I think I need to prepare myself and know that I'm going to be leaving and what other things that I get into and what other things that I don't get into. What am I leaving them with? Um, do they have other people? Connecting them with their community. A lot of the work, um, if I feel like I'm the only one who's doing that, doesn't help. So I think, you know, getting them connected with people within the community who end up forming a network amongst themselves. So these women that I started with a group with in Rohingya, they continue to meet. 
uh, when I go back, I'll get to meet with them, but it's, they'll continue. So it's something that's self-serving that they can continue on their own is important, that the reliance is not on one individual per se. So this whole idea of writing the guideline right now is partly about that, um, that you create a structure and then different people can continue that structure and way of uh, operating within the same space. I was wondering, you mentioned um, one line you had was uh, boundaries are cultural. Could you speak more to that? Mm. Um. In my mind, it's just so, so uh, like, you know, it just comes so naturally. Like, oh, yeah, the boundaries, everybody has a different way of understanding or making sense of boundaries, but boundaries. Um, are cultural because uh, they're partly internal, like you have your internal sense of what is okay, what is okay to cross, what's not okay to cross, and they're subjective in that sense. So they come and they shift. So they are cultural in that sense, but they're also cultural in the literal sense of, you know, um, boundaries of therapy are a cultural notion, boundaries and how you operate within the world, boundaries within a family, boundaries in all sorts of ways are cultural based on who you are and how that's made sense of, but their internal uh, sort of unconscious boundaries, <laughs> boundaries in terms of ways of thinking, boundaries in terms of ways of being. Um, it could talk about it in so many different ways, uh, but the cultural aspect is so apparent in all of those. Um, I don't know if I answered it or made it more complex, but. <laughs> about do, should we as psychologists or therapists talk about our own religion or spirituality as got boundary assumptions, right? Yes, that's so a good way of thinking. So what we've done here violates some of those assumptions. <laughs> I appreciate that way of thinking. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs>